All right, everyone, good morning, and welcome to Inorganic Ventures' first webinar of the new year. My name is James King, and I will be mo the moderator for today's session. We've had a great turnout of registrants and are very excited to bring you all tips for improving ICP calibration, specifically relating to troubleshooting. Inorganic Ventures will be hosting new webinars every other month in 2021. Be sure to mark your calendars for our next one on March 11th, again at 9 a.m. Eastern Standard, as myself and Thomas Kozakowski discuss washout considerations for ICP analyses. As we get started today, please feel free to submit your questions through the Q&A module located at the bottom of your screen. Our speakers will address these at the end and give you the opportunity to unmute and contribute to the conversation live if you'd like. Without further delay, I will introduce our speakers and get the ball rolling. Dr. Leslie Owens is an analytical chemist with research specialties including chromium speciation, environmental sample design, elemental spectroscopy, metal contamination in food products. Dr. Owens graduated from Emory and Henry with a BS in chemistry and a minor in mathematics. Dr. Owens, a Cunningham fellow, received her PhD in analytical chemistry from Virginia Tech. Today, Dr. Owens serves as our technical support manager here at Inorganic Ventures. Michael Booth is a chemist with expertise in quality, ex quality control and instrumentation. His experience covers areas including ICP OES, ICP mass spec, ion chromatography, and various uh, titration and wet method techniques. Today, Mr. Booth is the Director of Quality Control to Inorganic Ventures. And with that, I'll hand it over to Leslie and Mike. So thank you again for joining us. Thanks, James, for the introduction. And today we're going to give you a little bit of tips and tricks for improving um, ICP calibrations. So a good way of improving calibrations is by improving the stability of your calibration standards. Uh, you know, without stable working solutions, your analysis can suffer. So today's talk, we're going to focus on the key considerations for designing um, calibration solutions, how to prepare and handle these solutions. Um, and then we'll shift gears a little bit and get into the second part of the talk where Mike Booth will give you um, some potential causes for unexpected results and provide some basic information on troubleshooting these problems. The design portion of the presentation is to provide information that applies to commercially available uh, reference materials, as well as tips for those of you who may make your own working solutions. Uh, Inorganic Ventures has been designing and manufacturing reference materials for 30 plus years. So we have a, a vast experience in over these years that's given us a broad body of knowledge for um, designing reference materials. And this presentation is going to draw from that chemical expertise. Inorganic Ventures is an ISO uh, accredited reference material producer. You'll see this referred to as an RMP sometimes. So during our 30 plus years, we have approved about 57,000 solutions in our database. So these solutions have a, a range of complexity uh, going from single element standards um, to common multi-element standards, um, you know, those that are used in um, common methods like EPA methods. Um, and then we get into a an array of complex standards where we have trace levels of some elements with high or matrix levels of other elements. So we do specialize in designing custom products and we really enjoy the challenge associated with custom blending. So our standards are NIST traceable and they're provided with a certificate of analysis and that also includes the associated uncertainty. The certification method uh, will vary based on the uh, product or the intended use of the product. For example, a titrant would not be certified in the same manner that an ICP standard would be certified. In general, ICP users have two options for calibration standard preparation. So the first would be to purchase a ready to use solution from an RMP or the second would be to make your own solutions from commercially available stocks. Okay, the table here provides you some advantages and disadvantages of each method. 
And there's no one size fits all approach for the um, selector of how to prepare your calibration standards. And what we say around here is it should be fit for purpose. So it should make sense for your laboratory. That's gonna depend on the analytical goals of your laboratory. It's gonna depend on your budget, your level of accreditation, any audit protocols you may have, the training of your staff, the equipment you have, and so on and so forth. Most labs fall into the second category, uh, which is one of the reasons I would like to discuss the tips and tricks for designing stable working solutions. Okay. Regardless of the approach that you take, um, there's some key considerations for designing calibration standards. First, I'll talk to you about inter-element compatibility, uh, which is basically which elements get along with each other and which ones will need some special attention. Then um, I'll describe the container properties and how those influence solution stability. And then finally, I'll wrap up and discuss um, how the solution matrix itself plays a role in working standard design. So most of the information I'm gonna share with you today are lessons learned um, in our laboratory. Again, 30 plus years of experience, we've seen a lot um, in our laboratory. We also have a very robust stability program, which is required by ISO, and we use data collected in this program to create solutions that are have long-term stability. Okay, first off, inter-element concerns. So we're thinking about the periodic table. There's, you know, a lot of elements on there, and just like children on the playground, not all of them get along um, together at the same time. So based on all the personalities of these um, elements, you know, we found some um, key things that you need to be concerned with uh, when you're putting together um, working solutions. Um, so the first, uh, potassium and silicon, you can um, have a gel that forms at concentrations greater than about 200 ppm. So uh, here you won't notice it until you go to pour the um, solution out of the container that you've prepared. Um, and at that point, it's too late. So we recommend keeping those elements separate if you're above 200 ppm. Um, cesium has, uh, uh, shown some issues with precipitation. Uh, the first would be in uh, relationship with uh, platinum. So we have um, this um, chloroplatinate type compound that will precipitate out. Um, also with rhenium at concentrations greater than about uh, 200, uh, I'm sorry, 2,500 ppm, you can have precipitation um, with uh, cesium and rhenium as well. This is kind of important to note if you're trying to use cesium as an ionization buffer in any of your, um, any of your work. The next um, thing that you can think about is chromates. So chromates can um, cause precipitation problems in the presence of lead, barium, and thallium. So that's chromium-6 in the presence of those elements. So what we do here at Inorganic Ventures is use a chromium-3 um, species when we're blending um, uh, solutions so that we avoid any issues with chromate precipitation. Uh, carbon sources can cause problems, uh, specifically reduction to metallic forms, and this is most often seen with uh, things like mercury and palladium. Okay, so uh, typically we'll want to, you know, keep those sort of things separate. Carbon as itself you can, um, you know, be aware of, but also counter ions. So our beryllium um, it has an acetate um, component to it. So things like that kind of lurking in the background can cause problems with um, your mercury and your palladium. Uh, and then we have these things called geochemical twins that we need to worry about. So this is where you have an element paired with a second element. So zirconium and hafnium, niobium and tantalum, uh, molybdenum and tungsten, for example, are these geochemical twins. So we need to be concerned about the ratios of each of those elements when you're blending um, solutions containing uh, both of those elements. Um, so you could have contamination issues coming from a high level uh, of one and a low level of another. So something to keep in mind there. Uh, so next we can talk about container uh, concerns. So um, the composition, 
the cleanliness and the uh, matrix compatibility of your preparation and storage containers is really important when you want to maximize the stability of your working solutions or CRMs in general. So LDPE or low density polyethylene is the most common, uh, commonly used container um, at Inorganic Ventures. Um, this is because this is the cleanest and it provides a, a broad range of uh, solution compatibility. You can put a lot of different solutions into an LDPE. So we also have a specialized uh, leaching process to ensure an even cleaner bottle. So when we're working at low levels, things like uh, 100 ppb and lower, um, we would use a different um, bottle that we've cleaned in a different manner, and we would also um, put those together in a clean room, okay? So we have no issues uh, when we prepare uh, like this for common contaminants like calcium and sodium. So it's really important to have a clean bottle and uh, clean starting materials, okay? Not all solutions can be put in LDPE, unfortunately. Um, one that comes to mind is uh, mercury. So we have the issue of mercury and, and palladium also in nitric acid matrices where you can have an adsorption phenomena happening. So in those cases, we switch over to using borosilicate glass. So our cutoff is um, things less than about 200 ppm mercury and less than about 10 ppm palladium in a nitric acid only matrix. We'll shift that over to a borosilicate glass to prevent that adsorption phenomenon on the plastic. Okay, not all solutions we can do this for because HF in a matrix will cause an attack on a borosilicate uh, glass container. So at that point, you would want to separate your mercury or your HFs um, so that you don't have um, boron or silicon coming from the leaching of, of the glass into your solution. Uh, we also have contamination issues that we have to worry about with borosilicate. I said we liked LDPE because it's clean. We dislike boro because it's pretty dirty. So um, we have to be careful when we're, we're working with the common contaminants of borosilicate glass. So we have varying levels of um, acceptance for, um, you know, things like your, uh, your sodium and your calcium when we're dealing with borosilicate glass. Um, and it's not a one size fits all uh, approach for these contaminants, different, um, different elements would have a different impurity profile in the borosilicate glass. Okay. So the final consideration is a matrix consideration. So when you've decided on the combination of elements um, in your uh, working solution, as well as the, the concentration of those elements in your working solutions, then we need to think about what matrix is best for those. So we have limitations uh, for the most common uh, mineral acid matrices um, shown here, and we'll go through a, a few of those examples. So nitric is pretty much the um, the acid of choice for most chemists, you, you avoid any sort of chloride contaminate uh, interferences on mass spec applications, and you just can put a, a lot more things together with the, um, with the nitric. Um, some things to consider would be um, antimony. So the, the level of nitric when working with an antimony um, solution will be dependent upon the, uh, the way the antimony is stabilized. So you can stabilize antimony with HF or you can stabilize with tartaric acid. So if you're working with a solution containing uh, antimony stabilized with tartaric acid, you wanna make sure that your concentration of nitric stays 2% or lower. So what we found is a destabilization. So there's um, a reaction that happens with the nitric and tartaric acid. Basically you're degrading your tartaric acid. You have um, a destabilization that happens with antimony at that point. So you can have precipitation and your antimony is lower than you expect. Um, on the other side, you would like to go higher on a nitric content when you have of, um, arsenic, bismuth, and lead at 1000 ppm in your solution. So we found that this creates a, a stable environment for those three, um, those three solutions, or th those three elements in solution. Um, finally, gold 
uh, for nitric, you cannot blend gold in nitric only. You'll need to have some level of HCl in your matrix when you have um, when you have gold present. Okay, so talking about HCl, uh, we recommend that osmium is um, contained in HCl only. This prevents the uh, formation of the volatile and toxic um, tetroxide, and it's just for exposure in your laboratory best to keep your osmium away from nitric acid. Also, silver. You want to make sure you keep silver away from trace levels of chloride. Okay, so this is silver is photosensitive in the, uh, the presence of chloride. What you can have is a precipitation um, as the silver chloride. What we do is, you know, I say avoid traces. So what we do to shift the equilibrium of this reaction is provide an excess of chloride ions. So you want to go high on HCl if you have silver in your solution. 10% HCl for things about 10 ppm, and then the percentage increases as your silver also increases. Uh, you'll want to avoid uh, thallium plus one if you're working in an HCl matrix. Um, for the same reason, you'll get precipitation. If we have thallium and the matrix needs to be HCl, we will uh, change the oxidation state to a plus three to prevent that precipitation. Also with HF, so a lot of laboratories don't allow HF, but it is, you know, a, a good tool for the uh, for the chemist uh, in sample preparation. So if you have HF in your solutions, um, you want to be conscious of uh, rare earth elements. We call them HF sensitive elements. So these are your rare earths, your group 2As, um, thorium and chromium 3. Okay, so if you're having issues with any of those elements um, in your working solutions, um, just give us a, a call and we can walk you through kind of the levels and the ways that you can um, protect those elements uh, from HF in your solution. We've got uh, a, a photo here uh, demonstrating the uh, precipitation of silver in an HCl matrix, all right? So I, I mentioned that um, this, these are lessons learned in our laboratory. We use a lot of um, illustrative uh, photos like this to show that you know, we can create this problem in our laboratory. So this is an example of what happens when there are trace amounts of chloride and um, silver present. We have a PPB stability study on our website that's published um, by Dr. Paul Gaines. Um, so this gives you an idea of the length of stability you can expect when you're combining a lot of elements into um, a working solution. So in this study, we combined several stock solutions. We use the, um, the CMS set. So this would give you 65 elements um, over five different standards. All of those were combined in a 1% nitric matrix. And uh, from this study, you can see that some elements are more stable in this configuration than others. In general, there's just too much information to share in one slide. So I recommend that you visit our website. I've provided the link here on the slide to get more details. Okay, it just, it gives you an, an idea of what to expect. If you're having issues with a particular element, you can take a look at the PPB stability study and see if it's, is that expected or is that unusual? All right, so we can shift over into the last part of my presentation, which is the design and, I'm sorry, the, the handling and storage. So in this uh, particular section, we'll talk about the proper ways to prepare and uh, handle your working solutions and then how you can store those for maximum stability uh, down the road. Okay. So as I mentioned earlier, the majority of our customers create their own working solution from our products in some form or fashion. Um, in general, we recommend a gravimetric preparation um, as opposed to a volumetric preparation. So here what we're doing, what we're suggesting is you use an analytical balance, you weigh out your aliquots either directly into your sample bottle or into a weigh boat and then um, uh, quantitatively transfer that to your uh, flask 
And then you would write down the measurements and dilute to a certain volume if you're using the bottle approach uh, based on the density or to the volume of your um, volumetric flask. Okay, so we believe that, you know, pipettes have uh, issues with air bubbles, you have issues with viscosity of your solution, and we don't trust the milliliter that would be um, um, delivered from the pipette. So this is why all of our solutions are prepared using the gravimetric approach. Okay. Um, your bottle type, we mentioned earlier, you want to make sure that you're using a, a clean bottle that's compatible for your particular uh, application. Um, the usage period of your working solutions is a, um, a point that we get asked about often. Um, so it's going to be based on the things that we talked about earlier. So, you know, your analyte concentration, the matrix that you're working with, the container materials you've um, chosen, and storage environment. Um, Mike will talk a little bit about kind of the effect of transpiration in the laboratory, um, and you'll see that uh, and why that's important in just a few slides. Um, so generally what we tell people is we don't recommend that you hold your working solution for longer than one year. So what we say for our uh, solutions is once you open the TCT bag, you have the customary one year to use it. We recommend the same for your working solutions. Um, if you're noticing stability issues with your material, but it's few, a few months down the line, then what you can do is use what I call a pseudo stability study to establish an expiration date for your standards in your own lab. So for this, you know, what you do is um, a fresh prep um, compared against an aged prep. Um, and then you're looking to see um, if there's a statistical difference between the data. You don't have to use a, um, a calibrated set of data. You can look straight at raw data and make a comparison based on, uh, on what you see there. If there's no statistical difference observed in the fresh solution versus the aged solution, you can make the assumption that the uh, aged solution is still stable and assign the um, corresponding uh, number of months as the expiration date for that particular material. Okay. So I mentioned earlier that virtually all Inorganic Ventures uh, products are going to be packaged in either low density polyethylene or a borosilicate glass container. Okay, this chart will show you why we decide to go in that direction. This is just a table pulled out of a, a larger article on our website that talks about the different impurity profiles of container materials. So I mentioned your container is important when you're um, designing stable materials, and this is especially important when you're thinking about trace level work, okay? So you see the LDPE bottle is much cleaner than something like a borosilicate glass, and it's even cleaner than your uh, HDPE and the um, commonly used Teflon also in laboratories, okay? So just be aware of low level concentrations and the type of bottle that you are using. Other considerations for preparing your own solutions is just the, simply the amount of solution that you can put into, into your flask, right? So this is concentration dependent. Going back to analytical chemistry, this is your basic M1V1 equals M2V2 type equation, right? You're limited by the concentration of your stock solution as to how much you can actually put into the, um, into the working solution. Okay, so unfortunately at Inorganic Ventures, our concentrates and subsequently your concentrates are volume or concentration limited. So we have a finite concentration of these bulk concentrates that we can work with. So most uh, cap out at about uh, 50,000. I think our average is about um, 35,000 as the concentration. So as a result, we're limited by volume you're gonna be limited by volume too. So um, takeaway here is the number of elements per solution will decrease as the concentration of those elements increases in the working solution. So um, the info on the right gives you a rough estimate on the number of elements that you can put together at um, different concentrations. Again, lower concentrations put um, more elements together provided they play nice. 
uh, with each other. And as you get to higher concentrations, you'll see that you can put fewer. We do get a lot of requests. Uh, my team is primarily responsible for looking at um, the design of uh, CRMs on a daily basis. You know, we, we add about 10 new solutions um, per day to our database. Uh, we do get a lot of 10,000 PPM everything type requests that, um, you know, we, there's two approaches. You decrease the concentration to, you know, start minimizing the number of solutions you offer, or you split these offer at the 10,000 PPM, but offer several different solutions. So that's one of the things you'll see from Inorganic Ventures um, in the quoting process. Um, order of addition. So this one is really interesting. So over the years, we found that the order in which you combine the elements has an impact over on the uh, solution stability uh, in general. So uh, what we typically do in the manufacturing process is um, start with a mixture of water and the acid in a two to one ratio. Um, and then we start adding the aliquots um, for the blend itself by quantitatively transferring, you know, we're weighing on the balance into a weigh boat, quantitatively transferring into the flask and then swirling the flask um, to prevent any sort of pockets of localized elements or um, acid itself. Um, then we have solved some problems in the um, compatibility or the stability world by being aware of the order in which we add some elements, okay? Um, so osmium, you know, I mentioned we want uh, an HCl matrix only, but most of our concentrates are gonna come from um, a nitric matrix concentrate. Um, so when there's osmium present, you want to make sure you add that last so that you prevent the uh, exposure of osmium to a high nitric environment. So you want to dilute out the nitric as much as possible um, so that you don't form that um, tetroxide. Also your HF sensitive elements, you know, I mentioned you can contact us if you're having issues with um, HF and some of these elements. Um, Order of additions is mostly where we'll um, you know, tell you to look uh, if the concentrations are acceptable. So what you wanna do here is make sure that you're adding those sensitive elements last to prevent them from being exposed to locally um, concentrated levels of HF and you'll prevent the uh, precipitation as the fluoride salt. Okay. All right, so You've gone through the, uh, the process of preparing um, your uh, working solutions, but it's important that you handle the CRMs that you're diluting um, to make those working solutions uh, in an appropriate manner. Okay, so commercially available materials are going to come with the C of A to show you, you know, the concentration, um, the uncertainty, and so forth. Um, and then it also provides recommended um, storage and handling conditions for those materials in the C of A itself. You know, these are your typical good practices in your laboratory, you know, storing at a, a certain temperature, not pipetting from your stock bottle, um, and, you know, keeping your, your cap secure. Mike will actually show you some data on the, um, the, the cap um, torquing uh, and how that's important in your laboratory as well. Um, also, your safety data sheet is a good place to think about the, uh, the proper handling of material. So you want to, to make sure that you're consulting, um, you know, those two sources. You have any questions on how to use your material, you can always get in touch with us as well. Okay, so I mentioned uh, transpiration just now in relation to um, cap torquing. So transpiration um, can cause problems in your working solutions as well as your um, stock solutions. And this is the loss of water vapor from your bottle. Um, it happens through um, the walls of your bottle as well as around the cap itself. So you're losing water, which in turn gives you an increase in concentration. So the um, IV the approach to controlling um, transpiration, um, you know, in transit um, to your facility and before you use the bottle is this uh, over packaging technology. So this is called TCT in our world or transpiration control technology. So it's this uh, luminized over packaging um, that basically 
creates a microenvironment where transpiration is stopped in the bottle. This allows us to give you a longer expiration date on the, um, the stock solution that you purchased, right? So instead of shipping a bottle that has a one year um, usage period on it, you're in control of when that um, usage period starts. So customary uh, one year starts when you open the bag. Um, you have up to uh, four years to leave that in the bag. You can open it the day before the lot expiration and still be able to use the product and know that the, um, that the concentrations are what we say they are. Okay, so different things that affect um, transpiration. We have the, uh, the bottle size, um, you have um, the uh, volume, in the bottle, uh, temperature, and also the torquing. So uh, Mike will show you a little bit of data. We do have a uh, TCT um, webpage on our website. So inorganicventures.com backslash TCT will give you info on all of the things that I've shown. There's a, um, an overview article as well as a, a more technical article for uh, transpiration on our website. Okay, so that concludes um, my section of the presentation today. Um, we'll shift gears and we'll let Mike Booth talk to you guys about the um, ways to troubleshoot any sort of unexpected results that you may have from um, your ICP calibration. So with that, I turn it over to Mike Booth. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Mike Booth and my slides are going a little wild on me, but that's all right. So we are going to talk about the um, troubleshooting aspect. And really, there are three main types of errors we're going to address. Um, what to do when there's no result, a low result, and a high result. So we're going to go ahead and just jump into the no results. And honestly, that's the uh, easiest problem to fix if your plasma has um, stayed lit the entire time. Um, if you're getting no results because your plasma will not stay lit, that's more of a hardware issue that you may have to contact your instrument manufacturer. But if you have a constant plasma and you're still getting no results, 90% of the time, um, what you want to do is check the introduction system. So uh, the torch, the spray chamber, the nebulizer, the pump tubing, um, somewhere along there, you're going to either find a clog or some sort of a leak. Um, it's possible that you will see um, a lot of times in the, in the cases in our lab recently where we've gotten sort of a no result uh, is because we're seeing, you know, the spray chamber actually flood where the drain is not pulling correctly. Um, so all those things you want to check and all those things can be mitigated normally by a proper maintenance routine. Um, so it's just something to look out for, especially what we found recently is we've, we've switched over, and I know a lot of labs have switched over to um, plastic uh, intro system parts. So you can't really see clearly what's going on in there. They're very opaque. Um, so we've seen an increase of flooding the system. So it's just always something to keep, a, keep an eye out for. If, if you are seeing no results, it's probably something to do with the intro system. That other... 10% is going to be coming from if you have some sort of crazy tuning problem. So this slide sort of defines the what you're looking for when you're tuning your instrument on the ICP OES and the ICP mass spec. Um, so if your tune settings are way off, you also see no results. But most of the time that doesn't really happen unless you've experienced maybe some sort of power outage um, and it set some of the um, instrument settings, maybe the power settings down to a very low um, power setting. But when you're tuning, these are the things that you really want to look for. So, you know, high intensity, low RSDs on mass spec, you're also looking for low oxides and low doubly charged species. The biggest point to remember when you are tuning, though, is you only have to tune your instrument to meet your performance checks. So you don't have to hit, you know, the very lowest detection limit possible if you're not if your samples and your analysis are not chasing that low detection limit. So it's something you can either spend a half a day tuning an instrument or you know 20 minutes tuning an instrument. And really that um, 
half a day versus full day is on the ICP mass spec. Um, you can spend a lot of time. Sorry, guys, my slides are going a little wild on me. I'm not quite sure why. Um, the slides should be available afterwards, but we're just gonna we're gonna stop on this one, and I'll go back and touch on some of the slides that skipped over. Um, on ICP mass spec, you have the option normally to do an auto tune versus a manual tune. If you have the experience to do a manual tune on your ICP mass spec, I highly recommend it. Um, it's going to take time to really get confident at it, but you can honestly cut down the amount of time you would spend tuning, just learning what the sliders do, learning how, you know, everything gets affected with your, you should be using the same tune solution. So learning those sliders um, and how they will affect things. Um, you can go in and mainly tune an instrument you're really familiar with and probably half the time it would take an auto tune to do it. Um, so it's just something that we recommend that, you know, you really get used to if you are using a lot of ICP mass spec. Um, and then the other slide that it skipped over that we will have available is just our recommended maintenance schedule. Um, we have a recommended maintenance schedule. You'll want to check the documentation that came with your instrument should also have a recommended maintenance schedule. Um, but really how often you do maintenance is going to be entirely dependent on the samples you're putting through the system. So if you're running extremely um, high total dissolved solids um, samples through your system, you're gonna have to do more maintenance than someone who's looking at very uh, trace amounts. Um, same for matrices. If you're running a very concentrated matrix, your odds are you're probably gonna have to do more maintenance than someone who's running you know, an ICP mass spec, everything at one to 10 PPB and 2% nitric. There's not gonna be a whole lot of maintenance that needs to be done on that versus if you're running, you know, some sort of high salt matrix um, solution. So that brings us over to instrument operation. And this is sort of the, the last thing to touch on if you are experiencing an issue with no results. Um, if you think that everything else is, is looking good, double check your calibration standards. Um, you know, we're gonna talk more about stability um, but it is always something, if you're absolutely sure that the instrument is, you know, tuned where it should be, you're still getting no results. The last thing that you'll normally check is to make sure your calibration solutions, your tune solutions are correct. And accidents do happen. You may have grabbed the wrong bottle. Um, maybe there's some sort of stability issue you weren't aware of. So you could always make a fresh prep and go from there. Um, and if you're having issues after that, I'd recommend you contact um, either your instrument manufacturer with no counts, or you can contact you know, your CRM manufacturer as well. All right, so we're gonna go to um, low results next. Um, and normally low results nor will come from either a mixing issue or a stability issue. Okay. So mixing is normally the easiest issue to spot and the easiest issue co to correct. Um, a dead giveaway if you have a mixing issue is if you see every single one of your analytes is low. Um, that's a key indicator that the solution is um, not mixed properly. And we define being mixed properly as being inverted at least 50 times. Um, for, you can see in this picture, one of our our manufacturing text is inverting the flasks. That's for a relatively low volume. Um, we'd mix by inversion um, up to 200 liter drums with drum mixers, and those will spin for about an hour. So definitely more than 50 times, um, but at least a 50 times inversion when you're dealing with something, you know, on a small scale is what you're looking for. But again, you will see it if every, th every single analyte is coming out low, that's a dead giveaway. The other issue, if you're having a low result, is going to come from stability. So Leslie had mentioned, you know, sort of a pseudo stability um, study. If you know fresh prep versus an age prep, if you're um, sort of worried about, you know, the stability of your calibration solution, I would recommend that you definitely all the calibration solutions that you use regularly, you have some sort of stability data on. Um, you know, it could even be 
just the, as you run out, you're going to have to make a fresh dilution of that anyway, go ahead and run it head to head and keep some notes as to how long that last batch was. The more information you have, um, the more easy it's going to be for you to troubleshoot these types of situations. And this is just sort of a follow up um, the matrix considerations of the elements and whether or not they would be stable in nitric versus HCl. So these periodic tables are available on our website and I'll share a link to that to that specific article at the very end of the presentation. Um, so you don't have to copy everything down. It's this information is is widely available on our website. Um, but you'll notice, you know, most everything is happy in HCl. Um, the biggest issue with that is HCl is not really great for ICP mass spec. Um, you want you don't want to have that chloride interference in there, um, even though it is nice. You know, you can probably get just about everything in there, you know, at a reasonable concentration. That's why most of the time we stick, we stay away from HCl, even though you'll see when you're looking at these periodic tables that almost everything plays nice with HCl. Again, this one is um, elements requiring or that are stable in HF. So you'll see that some elements will definitely require HF. Um, and Leslie had talked about that earlier. There are some issues with that. Some labs don't like HF and there are definitely a lot of elements that do not play nice with HF that will crash out a solution, especially when you get to higher concentrations. So if you're having issues and you think it's related to matrix, um, definitely reach out and contact us. You know, we have a lot of background in this sort of thing and we can definitely help you out. All right, so the next type of error you might come across is a high result. Usually this is because of either transpiration that Leslie had mentioned, and we're gonna dive into a little bit deeper, um, some sort of interference or some sort of washout issue. So transpiration, we've already touched on, Leslie did a great job of you know, describing what transpiration is. Um, and these are just, this is some data that we've collected over time, um, monitoring transpiration and you'll see on this first graph, it's a percent change um, by bottle size. So the green line is a 30 mil bottle, the red line is a 125, the blue line is a 250 mil. So you'll see a greater percent change in the smaller bottle. Uh, contain, and especially with um, the amount of liquid that's left in the bottle. So sort of the headspace of air inside your bottle, that's what the um, second graph down here is. So when it's 100% filled over on the right hand side, you'll see a um, lower rate of transpiration than if it is only 25% filled sort of on the left hand side. So along with that, with volume level, you also have container materials. We prefer LDPE, as Leslie said, because it's a much cleaner material. Um, but we have seen that glass and HDPE do not have as high of a transpiration rate. So it's sort of a trade-off. If you're really worried about transpiration um, because of, you know, some sort of environmental issue um, and you're not so much worried about the cleanliness, you may want to investigate an alternate bottle type. And that's something that, you know, it's really going to depend on your method and what you're looking for. The last two graphs that we have are, you know, by temperature and also by torque. So you can see the hotter that the environment is of a bottle, the higher the rate of transpiration is going to be. So if you can essentially cool your standard down, um, it's going to negate the effect of transpiration. Um, that may or may not be an option, um, especially depending on where your lab is located. So the environment may be a little bit hotter in, you know, some areas and others. Um, you may not have the space to keep it as cool as you'd like. So this is just something to keep in mind as well as you might see a higher rate of transpiration depending on the just the environmental temperature. And then this was something we found that was very interesting was um, if you cap a bottle too tightly, um, you'll see a higher rate of transpiration than if you cap it at just the right amount of torque level. 
So it's something if you have someone in your lab that really tightens bottles, um, they might be doing a little bit more harm than good. So it's just something to keep in mind. So we've gone over sort of how you would, you know, what you're expecting to see. Um, this is just sort of how you would you confirm your results. So you can apply, you can use, you know, different methods. The, the biggest, you know, probably the best and most commonly used just to get a second source solution. So just another solution is exactly the same. It's made, you know, either from different starting materials. It could just be a different preparation, uh, maybe by a different person, a different day. Um, just some sort of second source that you that should be the same that makes sure you get the same readbacks. Um, running single element standards is another great way to make sure. So if you have a calibration solution that's multiple um, elements or analytes and you just want to double check, you could run a single element solution and make sure you're getting the proper readback. Um, if you're really having an issue in a very complex matrix, you could try standard additions where you spike in, you know, an extra amount of a certain element or elements or analytes. Um, but really the biggest thing when it comes to confirming your results is pulling the raw counts, the raw intensities, the looking at the raw spectra of your instrument will do you much better than just relying on the reports that the software generates. So the deeper you can dig into the raw data, the better understanding you'll have of what's going on. And really what you wanna look at is the blanks as well, because that's really where it's gonna pinpoint if you have any washout issues. So if you're seeing a lot of counts in your blanks at the end of your run compared to the beginning of your run, and you're seeing high results, that points to a washout issue. So it's just something to keep be mindful of is always take a look at the raw data. All right, so we're gonna move on to some more general tips. Um, like we had mentioned before, you wanna be mindful of the environment where your standards are, you know, temperature. Um, Leslie had mentioned, you know, try to keep them out of direct sunlight. Um, how, how filled up the bottles are, if they're running very low. Um, all of those things are gonna matter. It's all, it's all something to sort of keep an eye on and make sure that you're taking into account when you're troubleshooting if you're having issues with high results or low results. So when you're troubleshooting, we sort of created this checklist. The first thing is you wanna review the stability rules. Um, again, we'll sort of, we'll show where those periodic tables are that have, you know, some of the, um, the elements that play nice with the different acid matrices. Um, you'll want to make sure that you have your, your materials, your container materials properly cleaned. Um, this is something that whenever you're switching to like a new bottle type or a new vendor, you definitely want to take the time to check beforehand. Um, so just running the studies to make sure that, you know, even your pipette tips, your way boats, um, if you suspect anything has changed, um, doing some just basic studies to see how clean they are um, could help you out immensely. Um, again, you wanna make sure your standards are properly mixed. And if you're having issues, um, Leslie had shown some great pictures of how you can, how changing the order of additions can clear up some precipitation issues. Um, finally, if all that is, is you know, sort of still giving you trouble, you can always contact the certified reference material producer. Um, we have tons and tons and tons of experience creating these custom solutions. So it's definitely, we've probably seen whatever issue you're running into. Um, you know, but again, you also wanna make sure you have some sort of stability program um, and that you're just double checking everything. Um, because, you know, at the end of the day, there's always something that, you know, I hate to fall back on the example, but someone grabs the wrong bottle. It's the last thing you'd ever look at. Um, so human error is, you know, a factor as well. So, but feel free to reach out to um, us and we will try to help you in any way that we can, uh, which actually brings us to our next slide. All 
There we go. Um, we have technical support that's available to everyone. Um, we have a great online tech center. Um, and we also have a great uh, forum section on our website as well, where technical questions are submitted and answered by our staff. Um, and there's a tremendous history of questions. So you can, it has a nice search function. You can always go back. So it's something just to, to look at every so often. The resources on our website, if you go to inorganicventures.com and click on the education tab, you'll see a lot of different guides that have been written. Um, you'll, that's where our technical questions forum is. It's where our interactive periodic table is, which is another great resource. And finally, we have some links, some direct links um, to different resources and articles that have been written that are published on our website. And that very first link is where you can find those uh, periodic tables for like the nitric acid, the HCl, the HF, that's all in there. And Leslie has already mentioned, you know, the part per billion study, which is great. Um, you know, all of these different resources are available on our website. And if you ever have any downtime between analyses on your instrument, it's definitely something to check out. So with that, um, that is the end of this presentation. So I'm going to toss it back over to James um, for the question and answer session. Thank you guys very much. All right, Mike, Leslie, fantastic presentation. Thank you guys. Um, and it looks like we have some awesome questions here. So I'm just going to go ahead and jump right in. Um, the first one that came in, uh, are you all able to share your leaching process for LDPE containers? Sure, uh, I'll take that one, guys. Um, we use uh, nitric acid, a uh, 1% solution as the leach. Uh, we fill up the bottles. Uh, we let it sit for a period of seven days, rinse that uh, or dump that, rinse it um, three times with DI water and then let it air dry. Um, it's important to use a good quality of nitric acid, um, depending on um, you know the, the level of work that you use, you know, a, a PPB level um, acid may be appropriate, but if you need to um, you know, get a little cleaner, you know, maybe you need to think about a PPT level of, um, of um, the nitric acid that you're using. Uh, if you're also worried about cleanliness, you could jump into um, a, a specialized leach process, which includes a little bit of heat. Um, and we could talk a little bit more offline if you need more information on that. Okay, thank you, Leslie. All right, so I'm going to uh, move on. We've got a question here from, uh, from Brett. Could storing concentrated hydrochloric acid in the same room as a silver standard provide enough trace chloride to cause degradation? I'll take that one again. Uh, yes, we have seen that. Um, so what you would ideally like to do is keep any sort of um, uh, solutions containing silver as far away as possible from your HCL. If you could keep it, you know, outside of the laboratory, certainly don't keep it in the same hood. Um, and especially if, um, you know, you have a solution with um, silver and HCL, you want to make sure you're keeping that um, in uh, a dark environment as much as possible and avoiding the exposure to light as much as possible to prevent the photo degradation. Okay. Thank you. All right. So I'm going to move on because this is uh, somewhat related to the, the previous question. Um, there's a reference to not storing standards in direct sunlight. Uh, what about under typical laboratory lights and is a, uh, a dark drawer better? This is more of an issue of your silver and your HCL and your photosensitive issues. So the majority of your uh, solutions, they're going to be fine in regular light conditions um, on the bench top in the laboratory. It's just you need to be aware of silver in the presence of HCL and you want to keep that as dark as possible. You know, only bring it out into the light when you're using it. Okay. All right. So I'm going to move, let's see, we'll answer that one for the end. All right, this one uh, may apply more to Mike. Is there a tool to easily measure the torque applied to a cap? Yes, definitely. They're called um, torque wrenches and you can um, get various fittings that um, will fit onto your bottle cap and you can use those. We actually use that um, in our packaging line 
to make sure that the torque is just right for Department of Transportation requirements and to make sure that we're hitting the requirements of the bottles um, that we do not over torque them. So yeah, if you research um, torque wrenches, you should be able to find one um, and you just want to maybe get the adapter that fits your bottle type. Okay, thank you, Mike. Okay. All right, so moving along, uh, this question came from Mark. I noticed that you were using glass flasks to prepare your standards via weight. Do you have any process controls to limit the amount of static interactions with glass in your balance? Yeah, I can jump in on this one. Um, so yeah, that is a very good observation. We definitely notice, especially in the winter time, that we have um, some issues with static. So there are different um, safeguards that you can employ. Um, all of our balances have um, static guards on them. They're a little strip. Um, I believe they have polonium um, something in them um, that you sort of wave the flask over and it normally will eliminate any static. Um, we also have static guns um, that you can, if you're really having a bad issue with static and we'll normally see this with weigh boats the most, um, you'll set it on the balance, you know, zap it a couple times with the static gun um, and then go from there. But there are different systems available. Um, you can go the very high end route um, where there's a electronic system um, that will just sort of, you pass it by and it definitely eliminates the static or you can go sort of a static bar, static gun approach. Um, but you will see an increase in static in the winter for sure. Okay. All right. Um, okay, I'm interested in this one. Would you elaborate on which elements may require a specific order of addition when creating calibration, calibration solutions? Is there a resource to look up specific combinations we should be aware of? So I'll take that one. Uh, we don't have a particular resource on our website. Um, this is more of something where our technical support, uh, the forum or, you know, calling in live or um, emailing us a question, we, we would be able to help you out with that. But in general, uh, you want to keep your HF sensitives away from HF in general. So what you would do is you would add those last in um, solutions containing um, an HF matrix. Uh, you know, we did talk about the osmium. Um, and their uh, barium is another one that can um, cause problems. Uh, you can have uh, high concentrations of nitric cause uh, barium to fall out of solution. Um, so what you would want to do is, you know, make sure that you're avoiding the highly concentrated nitric environment for something like barium. Um, it's a good question and something that maybe we should put together a little guide on order of additions. Good. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, here's the next one from Andrew. I monitor testing performance for ICP mass spec over multiple cannabis labs across the country. All test for arsenic, cadmium, mercury, and lead. A few of them test for additional elements. One of the labs routinely has an issue for mercury failing low, below 85% recovery in the CCVs or check standards. The other labs not see this issue. Any thoughts on what could be causing this? That's a good question. I would, um, you might need a little bit more information, especially on the matrix. Um, so if you could follow up with us um, afterwards, if, if we get a little bit more information, I think we could probably um, provide some more help. But I think the matrix and, you know, f feel free to add in Leslie, um, nitric versus HCL is going to make a big difference when it comes to mercury. Yeah, I completely agree with everything Mike said. You know, send us a little bit more information and we can um, help you troubleshoot this mercury issue. The most common thing we see with mercury is the matrix. Um, you know, it can be fixed with a, a switch in container or a switch in matrix in general. And just a quick follow-up, if you want, uh, you can email info at inorganicventures.com and that will make its way uh, to our technical uh, technical folks, so we can help you out and follow up on that. Thank you, Andrew. Um, okay, we've got one from Michaela. Is it possible to get a recording of this webinar or PowerPoint? I work in an analytical facility uh, for nuclear waste in Washington State, uh, and she would love to share this with the other chemists and techs in her lab. So I think this is more of a uh, 
an administrative uh, question, but I think um, maybe either Leslie or maybe if uh, Josh or uh, Maddie want to jump in, because I believe we are recording these. Yes, Michaela, these will be recorded and provided, and we'd be happy for you to share those with your team. Okay, thank you. All right, um, we just have a couple more that we're going to try to work through. Uh, are some analytes more prone to not mixing well? I'll jump in on that one um, to start with. And Mike, you can add if you need to. I see you thinking on that one. Um, I can't think of anything that we have any mixing issues. You know, we're, we're working with things that are already into in solution. Um, so, you know, we have um, no problems that I can think of, of analytes that, um, you know, have issues mixing. You know, once you get it into the uh, solution form, it, it should be good to go um, when you're mixing. Mike, do you have any yeah, other the thoughts only, on that one? The only other thoughts I, I would have is we've not seen, you know, certain elements or stocks, um, you may be cautious if there's drastically different densities that you're trying to mix together or drastically different temperatures of solutions that you're trying to mix together. That might cause an issue, but if they're, you know, around about the same density and at the same temperature, we've not seen an issue with mixing. Good. Yeah. And I'll just, I'll just generally throw in uh, mixing by inversion is usually the cure-all for any kind of mixing issues you have. There's some people who like to kind of swirl around, but if you mix an inversion, uh, that will usually cure just about anything you've got. Yeah. All right. And I'm going to go with this last one. Um, what could be the potential reasons of specific wavelengths are showing no response during calibration while others result in the expected linear curve? Uh, the example pointed out is phosphorus 213 and phosphorus uh, 214 on the optical showing uh, expected results while 177 and 178 show no response. Sure, I'll jump in on this one. Um, so when you start getting down to, you know, that's not terribly low, um, but it's most likely some sort of issue with the detector um, because as you get lower in wavelength, more down into the, you know, the UV range, um, you may start to see some issues if the detectors are not um, operating as they should. Um, I would contact the instrument manufacturer and sort of probe them a little bit as to what their expected responses are for, you know, um, the wavelengths in that range. Um, there are some instruments that are, are better at measuring those lower wavelengths than others. Um, so I would reach out to your instrument manufacturer just to get some information um, about what they would expect um, your intensity reaction to be at various concentrations of phosphorus. Um, they should be able to give you a, a ballpark number of counts, you know, if you tell them you're running 100 ppm phosphorus at a certain range. Okay. Thank you, Mike. And we're, we're uh, a, a few minutes over time. I believe this is, this is scheduled through 10 o'clock. Um, I'm going to take this last question that we just typed in, and then we're going to, uh, and if you have any additional questions afterwards, please feel free to, to send everything to info at inorganicventures.com. We'd be happy to help you out. But I'm going to go ahead and end on this one from Gabriella. When running a calibration standard as a check standard in the same run, why would there be a difference in results between the two if they're exact same solutions and run back to back? Could that be due to instrument tuning? What suggestions would you recommend to fix this issue? Sure, so we've seen um, this happen and it really depends on how far off they are. Um, normally the, the result you're gonna get as it's run as part of the calibration curve is gonna be whatever you've typed into the instrument. And then when it calculates it that second time, it's gonna use all your calibration standards. So they might be slightly different. Um, if they are way different, um, that might be more of an issue, but if you're seeing, you know, a difference of, you know, one to 3%, it's probably the math that's happening to take into account. Um, instead of say, if your calibration st standard is 10 PPM and your readback is, you know, 10.02, it's probably the math um, that's happening to create that calibration curve to analyze that second run of your calibration standard. 
I agree with Mike on that. It's going to be the error associated with your calibration curve itself. Um, you know, depending on where your check solution is on the calibration curve, you think about um, the error associated with your curve has a bow tie type effect. So less error in the middle, more error on the uh, high end and low end. So it, it's a function of the, the goodness of your calibration curve and the uncertainty attached to that curve and the math that's happening in the background um, to get you your, um, your calibrated answer. All right, everyone, thank you for uh, attending today. Um, that concludes our, our first webinar for the year for 2021. Um, we thank you again for attending. Uh, we appreciate the questions and the discussion. And if you all, as always, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, at info at inorganicventures.com. Um, otherwise, thank you. Have a good day. And, uh, and once again, we appreciate your time. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Thank you all.